Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Hassan Sabir. I am the Finance and ESG Director at EPRA. Together with my colleague uh, Anastasios Mitsios, uh, who is the RNA Manager at Hewitt EPRA, we will be presenting on the new EPRA BPR guidelines. Um, before we jump into the changes that have been incorporated as of uh, October last year, uh, I would like to give a brief overview of how the EPRA BPI guidelines assessment has evolved uh, over the years. So EPRA together with its uh, external partner Deloitte conducts a yearly survey in which we look at companies BPR disclosure uh, according to the EPRA BPI guidelines and we provide an assessment for market stakeholders to understand the level of disclosure and how each company is perform performing against the recommended uh, BPI guidelines. So the aim and scope of the survey is whether the companies have disclosed information uh, as per the pre BPI guidelines. Um, of course, the challenge for EPRA has been for the last many years to bring in as many companies on board uh, so as to disclose the BPR KPIs. Um, as you can see on the slide, uh, which should be on your screen, uh, from 2014 to 2019, uh, the scope has increased significantly. So in 2014, we surveyed 84 companies. And in 2019, which was last year, we surveyed 175 companies. To give an overview of how the assessment is done, uh, EPRA and Deloitte award uh, uh, an award to the company based on their BPI disclosure. So the highest level of award that, that can be given to a company is the EPRA Gold, BPI Gold Award. Uh, the second uh, category below that is called the EPRA BPI Silver Award. And the last category, which is the minimum threshold we expect companies to disclose upon is called the EPRA BPR Bronze Award. To achieve EPRA Gold Award, we expect companies to report all six EPRA performance measures and to score 80% or above. We also have most improved award category, uh, which is awarded to companies which report, which have a significant improvement in their reporting uh, compared to last year, uh, in which case it's 30% improvement. Just to emphasize these awards are not an end to itself. Uh, they are meant to provide a first level filter to how companies are reporting under their PREBPR guideline. However, they do provide excellent visibility for internal and external stakeholders. So the slide that you see on your screens right now is a snapshot of the highlights uh, where in 2019, 124 awards were presented, uh, which represented 87% of the companies by market cap. Going down to the category of each award, in 2019, there were 80 EPRA BPR Gold Awards, 31 EPRA BPR Silver Awards, and 13 EPRA BPR Bronze Awards. To give comparison to how performance uh, of disclosure has changed in 2015, the numbers were much lower. So for example, the BPR Gold Award, we had 33 companies achieving that. So this testifies to the robustness of the BPR guidelines, uh, where most of the uh, European listed real estate market has adopted their BPR guidelines. We've had significant change year over year. So also in 2019, uh, we had nine new companies which reached the highest gold award compared to last year. Uh, by market cap, 72% of the EPRA members received a gold award. Continuing on the highlights and, and, and contrast to how the performance has, disclosure performance has evolved over the years. Um, in 2015 to 2019, as you can see on your screens again, uh, we have gone from 60 awards in 2015 to 124 awards in 2019. And this has fit into very well with EPRA's strategic plan, which was uh, put into place in 2015. 
and we are very happy to say that we have exceeded the EPRA target uh, for uh, companies achieving uh, PPR award. So we have been successful in achieving our journey towards greater tra transparency and providing investors with information that they find valuable. Um, the slide that you see on your screen provides a bit more granularity on um, the survey of 2019. Um, some of the main points to take away from this slide is that on a like for like basis, uh, 10 companies achieved a higher award versus last year, um, which includes uh, six new gold awards. Um, under the most improved categories, we had GMP and Fabigay achieve uh, the most improved award. So there was uh, exceptional uh, improvement in the disclosure, which uh, got them to uh, have this award. Having said that, we are still uh, working with some companies to improve their BPR disclosure. Um, and eight companies as of 2019 did not disclose any BPR uh, metrics. Moving on to the next slide, um, we have presented here a snapshot of the popularity of each and every EPRA KPI. So as can be seen from the slide, EPRA NAV remains the front runner with 95% of the companies says disclosing EPRA NAV. Uh, second runner up is EPRA earnings with 84% of companies reporting EPRA earnings. And as we go down the scale, uh, triple and net AV, uh, 79 companies percent companies reported that KPI, 70 percent companies reported their brand IY, 70 percent reported company, companies reported vacancy rate, and 63 percent reported top top and IY. Cost ratio still is lagging in, in being adopted by the companies, whereas 59 percent of the assessed companies reported for cost ratios. We also provide recommendation on non-core disclosure, which covers like-for-like -like rental growth and capex. Like-for-like uh, -like rental growth has more traction uh, being reported. So 63% of the companies assessed in 2019 reported like-for-like -like rental growth. However, capex is lagging significantly behind. We're working with all property companies to improve capex disclosure as well. So again, um, just to summarize the increase in, in strong improvement uh, in the performance of the last four years, um, the two charts that you see on the screen are on a like-for-like -like basis. So the same companies, uh, if you look at them from 2014 and how they evolved to 2019, we see that uh, there's been significant improvement in those companies uh, adopting and disclosing a pro VPR. However, there's always room for improvement. Um, we at EPRA recommend companies to use the EPRA recommended template for the disclosure. And in addition, we always advise to provide detailed calculation of the EPRA metrics. We at EPRA believe that the granularity of the calculations is the real value add uh, for the market versus the actual number itself. Of course, we are also working with uh, the listed real estate sector to improve disclosure on network cost ratios, capex reporting, like for like rental income growth, and of course, to, to provide comments and analysis on variation versus last year, etc. Regarding how the assessment is done, 75% um, of the assessment takes into account the six performance measures. 6% uh, of the assessment is based on the general recommendations that EPRA advises via BPR guideline, and 19% assessment is based on the uh, investment property reporting. So there are no changes uh, for 2020. Uh, however, in 2021, uh, we would be adding an extra layer on the assessment process where we expect companies to disclose all calculations as well. We will be communicating those changes uh, in the coming months. So that was an overview of the EPRA 
BPR reporting performance uh, for the listed European sector uh, as how it was done in 2019. Uh, we would now like to deep dive more into the changes that have been adopted since last year. More significantly, those changes reflect changes to the FRNAV and KPIX disclosure. So one of the main questions that we get asked from EPRA stakeholders is uh, why did we uh, go about with this exercise? To provide a bit of context to why the changes have taken place, uh, the, the discussion on EPRA NAV had started around four years ago. Um, and in some form or format, uh, it, it became a formal project uh, about two years ago. So in, in 2017, EPRA formally took up, took up the task of looking at revision of EPRA NAV and how that can be improved. And after a detailed and very structured process of two years uh, involving all major EPRA stakeholders, we were able to come to the final uh, result, which is the new EPRA, KPI, uh, EPRA NAV KPIs. Um, one of the reasons why this was deemed necessary was that EPRA NAV has remained as it, in its original format since 2003. To give a bit of context, in 2003, France had barely launched its SIP reform. The UK and Germany were still four years away from introducing their own REIT regime. So there has been significant changes in the market uh, over the last 15 to 16 years. And one of the reasons was to look at what the changes, to reflect a, a metric to, which shows those changes. Also, we've seen the business uh, evolve from uh, a passive long-term asset owner into an active asset manager and capital allocator. So it was deemed necessary that the EPRA NAV now reflects the changes which have taken place over the last 16 years. Some of the other objectives behind this exercise was also to better reflect the difference between REITs and non-REITs. It was also meant to show the understanding of the main components which constitute the value of a real estate company. Um, there have been some changes in IFRS uh, over, the few, over the last so many years, um, for example, on hybrid instruments. There was a need to also address such changes in the new EPRA NAV. Also, there was a feedback from the market that they would like to see a range of values to, to make their, their decision on. Um, and that's why we felt to expand from two EPRA NAVs to three EPRA NAVs at the stand now. One of the main objectives was also to provide an apple to apple comparison. So if uh, a pre NAV number is compared to another one in a different jurisdiction to a different company, there should be uh, in, in comparison. The process involved a consensus driven approach from all industry stakeholders. All the geographies of your membership were involved, asset classes, but also input from the investor community was also taken on board. So what are these three new APRA NAVs? The first one is APRA net reinstatement value. And this value is meant to demonstrate how much would it cost to rebuild the company with the assumption that no selling takes place. The second of the new APRA NAVs is called the APRA net tangible assets. This assumes that entities buy and sell assets, thereby crystallizing certain levels of unavoidable deferred tax liability. And the third of these EPRA NAV is called the EPRA net disposal value, which means how much value would an orderly sale of the company has achieved. You see on your screens on the right side, we have done a comparison of the old EPRA NAV to the new one. What needs to be noted that there is no one-to-one -one change. So it's not that EPRA NAV has become EPRA NAV or EPRA NAV has become EPRA NTA. The concept behind the old EPRA NAV was specific to that, that EPRA NAV. And the new EPRA NAVs are meant to reflect a bit of change to that. And one of the changes that was what we had seen during our consultation process was that the NAVs being reported by property companies in continental Europe 
uh, had different adjustments compared to now being reported by the U UK property companies, for example. And we felt necessary that in order to provide uh, apple to apple comparison, we have to introduce, for example, three categories to for companies to uh, put in the adjustments which they feel fit uh, for the business. Moving on to the next slide, I would like to provide a little bit more detail on what the background uh, to the new metrics has been. As I had explained earlier, um, the project was formally initiated in September 2017. Uh, the process took two years of consultation within the APRA reporting and accounting team, the APRA reporting and accounting committee, and its subcommittees. To provide a bit of background to the APRA reporting and accounting committee, it's comprised of 15 property companies, uh, which represent more major geographies in Europe and also the major asset classes. It also comprises of four investor representatives and also the big four audit firms. The idea behind the committee on the current project and previous and new projects has always been to have representation from all aspects of the listed real estate side. Um, so of course, we also um, engaged externally with the APRA wider membership during this project as well, uh, which included companies which were not part of the reporting and accounting committee, but also investors, analysts, and other accounting firms. The metrics have been extensively discussed on the committee level and also at the APRA board level, and were formally finalized in October 2019. The APRA Board of Directors uh, went ahead and approved the, the, the publication of the new guidelines into the public domain on 4th November 2019. On the bottom part of the slide that you see on your screen, we again gave a bit of uh, background to the NAV metric itself. Uh, as of 2015 to 2019, this has the, the reporting traction has improved considerably, as has been the general adoption of the APRA PPR metrics. You have some other stats uh, as well on the bottom end of the slide. Um, but I think the main point that I want to make here is that 95% of the companies that were surveyed in 2019 reported APRA NAV. So without doubt, APRA NAV has had been the most important non-GAAP measure that the listed European real estate sector reports on. And we hope with these changes, um, the importance of the APRA NAV continues to grow. Moving on to the next slide, we would like to provide you with a snapshot of the timeline uh, related to the application of the new APRA NAV metrics. The new APRA BPR guidelines are effective for the counting period starting on or after January 1st, 2020, and will be the basis of APRA's BPR awards in 2021 and beyond. We encourage all listed European real estate companies to use and adopt the BPR for the purposes of the full year uh, and the reports. We also encourage companies to provide a bridge between the previous APRA NAV metrics and the ones calculated under the new uh, BPR guidelines. This will help uh, the user of the statements to understand how the two metrics uh, match. On the same slide, we provide uh, visual guidance on the timelines uh, of how the uh, application of these guidelines will work in practice. So for example, for a company which has its full year in, in December 2019, we'll be reporting the new NAV metric in the December 2020 full year results. And we also have mapped that out for reporting periods which start beyond, for, for, for example, uh, um, December 2020. So for example, uh, for a company which has a full year uh, reporting period starting on Q2 of 2020, we will see the impact of the new APRA NAV metrics in Q2 of 2021. Moving on to the next slide. Um, this is just to provide a bit of context to 
April's communication and education plan on the new uh, BPI guidelines. So uh, in consultation and agreement with the April board, uh, communication timeline was initiated from November 2019 to February 2020. We are now in the process of educating the market, which lasts for all of 2020. Uh, we're targeting an audience of property companies, analysts, investors, etc. For this education part, we're partnering up with the big four local associations, data and service providers. On communication side, we have been mailing out generally on all EPRA media. Uh, we have been providing uh, webinars such as this one for the market to, to understand and, and get in touch with us if they have any queries. And also there has been various coverage uh, in, in print media uh, on the new changes. So we continue our education plan. Uh, unfortunately, we are in a crisis period, which we didn't expect to be in. Uh, we had quite a few workshops scheduled for Q1 and Q2 of this year, which we will be postponing for Q3 and Q4 of the for this year as well. Um, and this webinar that we are presenting right now is meant to be a stock cap arrangement. So companies are still able to understand and, and question if they have any questions on the new PPR metrics. On the next slide, uh, I would like to show you how the new APRA energy metric table looks like. Um, I think one of the key points that might be obvious on, on this new table is that the starting point for all three APRA NAVs is now the IFRS equity attributable to shareholders. This was not the case in the previous version, uh, whereas APRA triple net AV actually was derived from the APRA NAV, and APRA NAV, yes, was derived from the IFRS equity side. So if a company discloses according to this table, um, a user of that information can easily identify the, the common base starting point and obviously compare and contrast the different adjustments based on the different concepts of each and every nav. Um, I would like, just like to summarize again the key changes which are part of this new APRA guideline. So number one change on the new nav guideline is the exclusion of hybrids that do not add to the share capital attributable to owners of the parent. Another major change is deferred tax connected to fair value of investment property. And on the EPRA NTA side, we provide three options for deferred tax treatment. We've also provided adjustments on goodwill and intangibles as per the IFRS balance sheet. We've also included revaluation of intangible to fair value. And lastly, the, one of the major change has been the inclusion of adjusting real estate transfer tax. So as to add back any real estate transfer tax that was deducted by the values. And this is just a very high level summary of the main changes. Um, and now I would hand over um, the presentation to my colleague, Anastasios, so he can do a more deep dive into the, the changes. Anastasios, over to you. Thank you, Hassan, and hello, everyone. This is Anastasios Mitskios. I am the Financial Reporting and Accounting Manager at EPRA, and I will continue the presentation by elaborating further on the key changes that the new guidelines are introducing. So moving on to the next slide, here we can see a set of tables where on the left side, we have the current form of the NAV metrics, such as EPRA net asset value and EPRA triple net asset value, which I'm sure everyone is familiar with. And on the right side, we have the three new NAV metrics, such as NRV, NTA, and NDV. I think it would be useful if we compare the adjustments on a line-by-line -line basis in order to better understand what has changed and what has remained identical between the two forms. Before doing that, though, I wanted to point out that those line items that are highlighted in an orange box are referring to adjustments that are completely new in the new NAV metrics form. 
Those line items that are highlighted in the blue box are referring to adjustments that are identical between the current form of NAV disclosure and the new NAV metrics. And those that are highlighted into a green box are referring to adjustments that have been existing also in the previous guidelines. However, the underlying logic has been slightly revised or refined. So as you may have noticed, the common starting point for all three new NAVs is IFRS equity attributable to shareholders. This has not been the case for the current form of EPRA NAV. You had EPRA NAV being derived from IFRS equity and EPRA triple NAV being derived from EPRA NAV. Under the new NAV metrics disclosure, we have a common starting point and we believe this is a positive thing. Now the first adjustment is referring to hybrid instruments such as convertibles, warrants or preference shares. And the idea is to exclude the hybrids that don't add to the share capital attributable to the owners of the parent. <clears throat> this adjustment is applicable to all three NAVs and uh, it's not an entirely new co concept. It is basically referring to the calculation of NAV on a diluted basis. We just provide some more guidance how, on how to adjust those hybrid instruments. So if I want to give you an example for convertibles that are out of money, the expectation is to exclude the portion of the convertible that is classified as equity under IFRS. Under this approach, uh, the convertibles will be treated as if they were entirely dead. And on the other hand, for convertibles that are in the money, the expectation is to include that part that is classified as debt under IFRS. Under this approach, uh, the convertibles will be treated as if they were entirely equity. Now, if we move on to the next set of adjustments, these are basically referring to conversion of fair value to fair value of uh, certain non-current assets. And, uh, the logic has remained the same between the current form of NAV disclosure and the new metrics. Uh, this revaluation can be referring to investment properties if the cost method is used, or evaluation of properties under construction, other non-current investments, tenant leases held as finance leases, and revaluation of trading properties. So nothing has changed really on these calculations. The first major change is referring to the deferred tax calculation, which is applicable to NRV and NTA, whereas uh, deferred tax is not added back for the purposes of calculating NDV. For EPRA NRV, all deferred tax is being excluded, and that is also connected uh, to the underlying assumption of NRV, where no selling of assets takes place. Now under EPRA NTA, there are three options for the companies to choose. Under option one, if the company has clearly identified part of its portfolio as long-term hold, then 100% of that deferred tax liability linked to this portfolio can be excluded. That was case number one. Under case number two, if the company based on its track record can support partial deferred tax liability on sale, then that is the percentage to use. In all other cases, 50% of the deferred tax is being deducted, and that is option number three. I wanted to point out here that uh, it is within the company's uh, assessment to determine which part of the portfolio qualifies as long-term hold, but uh, in any case, the expectation is for companies to document the choice made for calculating NTA and provide the necessary disclosure. So moving on to the next adjustment, fair value financial instruments. This is applicable to NRV and NTA, and the logic has remained identical between the current form and the new NAV metrics. And this also applies to goodwill as a result of deferred tax, which applies for all three new NAV metrics, and the logic has remained the same. The new set of adjustments are referring to goodwill and intangibles as per the IFRS balance sheet, and these are completely two new adjustments that are being introduced with the new guidelines. 
both are included under NRV and that is because uh, NRV also tries to represent what is the value of the company's overall business. Whereas both are excluded from NTA on the basis that NTA tries to represent what is the value of the company's tangible assets. Uh, intangibles are not adjusted under NDV and that is because under IFRS intangibles could have some value in uh, an orderly set of business. The next adjustment is referring to the fair value of fixed interest rate debt, which has remained the same as the previous uh, NAV calculation and is applicable only for EPRA and DV. Moving on to revaluation of intangibles to fair value, this is a new adjustment that has been introduced in the new NAV disclosure and applies only to EPRA NRV. One thing to note is that uh, this adjustment is optional for companies to follow, so it's not a compulsory for companies to adjust for this revaluation. The recommendation is to use an external uh, appraiser to determine the value of intangibles. And we can look uh, on the next slide an example on how the calculation could be made. The last line item is referring to real estate transfer tax, which again is a new adjustment that is being introduced with the new guidelines. And uh, the adjustment is applicable to EPRA NRV and EPRA NTA. For EPRA NRV, the transfer tax that is detected in the valuation certificate should be added back and not the notional amount when those two differ. Again, this is under the assumption that uh, IFRS financial statements follow the valuation certificate uh, and the IFRS statements uh, have the value after deduction of the purchase's cost. Whatsoever, the adjustment should be calculated in such a way that after the adjustment, the property values in the NRV are gross and that is basically before any transfer tax deduction. So to give an example, uh, in the, the scenario where the gross property value in the valuation certificate is 100 million and the transfer tax is 6%, then the net value that is after purchases costs and usually reflected into the IFRS statements is 94 million. So in this case, the transfer tax that was deducted, which equals to 6 million, should be added back for the purposes of EPRA NRV. Now for EPRA NTA, there are two options. Under option one, the recommendation is to follow the IFRS value, which basically means that no adjustment for transfer tax is being made. And that is under the assumption that IFRS statements follow the valuation certificate. And uh, under option two, the companies could optimize the transfer tax. So the expectation here is to use an effective transfer tax rate. For example, if uh, the past has proven that 50% of the property transactions have been done by a share deal, thereby avoiding paying a transfer tax, and the other 50% uh, have been asset transactions where the full notional amount of transfer tax was paid by the buyer, then under the optimization option would suggest an adjustment of 50%. So in the previous example that we had, where we had the property portfolio of 100 million and the transfer tax as 6%, on the basis that 50% of the transactions have been made via share deals, then the adjustment for NTA optimization purposes should be 3 million. So hopefully now we have a better high-level understanding of the key changes that the new guidelines are introducing and we can move on to the next slide where we can see some issues in relation to past reporting examples and how the new NAV metrics can help into addressing those. Here we see two examples of NAV calculation with uh, both of them having June 30th as period end date which is a date that is preceding the publication of the new BPR guidelines that were published on November 2019. And uh, we can start with the example on the left-hand side first, 
The issue here is that uh, several companies, especially in continental Europe, are including revaluation of intangibles or real estate transfer tax in the reported NAV. This practice is not usually followed by UK REITs and that creates a discrepancy. Both companies are essentially disclosing NAV or triple NAV, however, the underlying adjustments are being different. So if we look in more detail this example, there are two line items that have been highlighted into a red box. The first one being unrealized capital gains on management service activities. If we look at footnote B, we can see that this line item is actually referring to revaluation of intangibles. Footnote B reads as the external valuation of management service activities stood at 365 million, while the recurring amount in the consolidated financial statements was 29 million, giving rise to an unrealized capital gain on these activities in an amount of 336 million. So in essence, what this particular company has done, it has used an external appraiser to determine the value of their intangibles. And uh, the difference between the value that has been determined by the external appraiser and the value of intangibles that has been reflected on the balance sheet has been included as an adjustment in the, to the APRA-NAV calculation. The next line item that is of interest is referring to transfer taxes restatement. Again, if we look at footnote C, we can see that external appraisers value transfer taxes payable on the whole portfolio as 951 million, considering that all properties would be sold through asset deals. However, the company has determined that the value of transfer taxes would fall to 567 million on the basis that some of the transactions would be based on share deals instead. So the difference between the, those two amounts has been included as an adjustment into the EPRA NAV calculation. <clears throat> Under the new NAV metrics, certain items such as revaluation of intangibles or transfer tax that were included into the previous example and that were merged into EPRA NAV are now presented separately, <clears throat> facilitating apples to apples comparison. Although we understand that the rationale for companies to adjust for uh, through evaluation of intangible assets or uh, transfer taxes, at that point in time when this publication was made, when those financial statements were published, revaluation of intangibles or transfer taxes were not part of the official NAV guidelines. So in that sense, it created a discrepancy in how EPRA NAV was calculated throughout the different jurisdictions or different markets. Now under the new EPRA NAV metrics, we have a uniform calculation and uh, it is clear that for this particular example, uh, EPRA NRV may be more comparable to what this particular company has been disclosing as EPRA NAV historically. So moving on to the second example, this is referring to goodwill. A number of companies are excluding goodwill in the current EPRA NAV uh, and this is also in line with analysts and investors models or expectations. However, occasionally there can be an inconsistency in bottom line NAV figures as not all companies follow this practice. So from this particular example we see that the company has adjusted goodwill below the EPRA NAV calculation and has derived the value for adjusted NAV. So under the new NAV metrics, goodwill is excluded from NTA, but included into EPRA NRV. This not only allows apples to apples comparison, but also demonstrates the evolution of a company's organic growth instead of growth through M&A activities. For this particular example, we can see that um, adjusted NAV may be more comparable to EPRA NTA going forward. And I just wanted to point out as a side note that NRV may be more suitable for companies that choose NAV uh, to highlight what is the overall value of the company's business and NTA may be more uh, relevant for companies that want to highlight what is the value of their tangible assets. In any case, companies are expected to report all three new NAV measures. However, they're free to choose the one that is most relevant for their business model as their main one and communicate this into their headline results. And we can move on to the next slide.
So far, the discussion was revolved mostly around the new NAV metrics. However, the new BPR guidelines are also introducing some changes, minor ones, into the CAPEX disclosure. So on the left side of the screen, we can see what are the current CAPEX guidelines. And on the right side, we can see the new changes into the CAPEX disclosure. Why CAPEX was changed is that uh, disclosure and transparency on capital expenditures, apart from certain examples, remains rather limited. An understanding of how much CAPEX was spent in the reporting period or whether this expenditure was expensed or capitalized would be helpful for users of financial statements. So under the new CAPEX disclosure, it is recommended that CAPEX is split between expenditure used for the creation of additional letable space and enhancing existing space, thereby providing additional insight into rental growth sustainability. So from a first look on the set of tables, we can see that the new CAPEX disclosure is introducing further granularity for the like-for-like -like portfolio calculation. That is adjustment number C on the left-hand side. Like-for-like -like portfolio has been renamed to investment properties and can be further broken down into incremental letable space, no incremental letable space, tenant incentives, and other material non-allocated types of expenditures, which would include all other adjustments that will not fall under the other line items. Now there are certain rules in terms of classifying the additional letable area and enhancing existing space. One thing to clarify here is that additional letable area is referring to incremental letable space and enhancing existing space is referring to no incremental letable space. Now the first condition is that where expenditure is spent on both existing and incremental space, then an estimate of the split should be made. If that is not possible, expenditure should be classified as incremental letable space, where available letable space is increased by 10% compared to the total letable area of the asset. Otherwise, it should all be included under no incremental letable space. And that was a high level introduction of the new CAPEX disclosure, which has not drastically changed compared to the previous recommendations. Nonetheless, I would encourage you to dig deeper into the guidelines in order to better understand the changes that are being introduced both for the new NAV measures and for the CAPEX disclosure. Those are available on EPRA's website, along with an NAV FAQ document, which provides some further background on the recent update. So having said that, we can proceed with the next set of slides where we can see an overview of how EPRA's finance team can support your firm throughout the process of adopting or understanding the new guidelines. On the left of this slide, we can see the EPRA BPR feedback report, which is circulated to companies participating in the yearly BPR awards assessment, which uh, EPRA conducts in collaboration with Deloitte. In a nutshell, the primary purpose of the report is to assist companies in identifying the main focus areas where disclosure can be improved uh, by elaborating further on how the company's award was determined, as well as how to meet the minimum threshold in order to improve the award received from a lower category one to the higher one. So having said that, the new BPR guidelines will be the basis for the 2021 awards which is something in line with uh, the implementation timeline of the new NAV measures and CAPEX disclosures. To remind you, the new guidelines are applicable for accounting periods starting on or after January 1st, 2020, meaning that companies with December 2019 as fiscal year end are expected to adopt the new disclosure for the first time in their annual 2020 accounts which would have a period end date of uh, December 2020. Likewise, companies with March 2020 as fiscal year end are expected to implement the new recommendations in their annual 2021 annual accounts, which would have a period end date of March 2021. So going back to the feedback report example, this is structured as follows. On the left side, we can see the medal awarded to the participating company, 
and below that the total score for the current and previous year as a percentage. The overview section includes a comparison of the company's disclosure performance, that is uh, the blue line, relatively to all other companies that are participating in the survey, and that would be the orange line. Last, the EPRA performance measure section outlines the company's compliance with the main EPRA KPIs. Now in the main part of the feedback report, we can see the compliance in relation to all disclosure elements that are taken into consideration when determining uh, the final score. A full blue circle means full compliance with a disclosure requirement, while uh, an uh, orange color means that there are certain areas of improvement. A full orange circle, which um, is not included in this example, implies zero compliance. So to recap, there are three elements, uh, each one with uh, its own weight, that are taken into consideration when uh, determining the word. The first one is the six uh, EPRA performance measures, such as uh, EPRA earnings, NAV, triple NAV, NAY, vacancy rate, and the cost ratios. The six EPRA performance measures account for 74% of the total score. The second element is general recommendations, which account for 6% of the total score. And the last one is what uh, we name as core recommendations, which incorporate the disclosure of like-for-like -like rental growth and capex. Those core recommendations account for 20% of the total score. In this example included here, the company has full compliance with EPRA earnings, NAV, and other certain measures, and partial compliance with vacancy rate, cost ratios, and capex. Now on the right-hand side, we can see the online BPR advisor tool that is available on the finance section of EPRA's website. This tool allows EPRA members to review BPR implementation guidance and uh, to submit queries. Those queries, um, which could range from technical assistance in relation to implementing the guidelines or uh, any other matters uh, connected to financial reporting, are then reviewed by EPRA's finance team in collaboration with a panel of big four experts. So having said that, these were the two of the ways where EPRA could support your firm in the implementation phase of uh, the new BPR guidelines. In addition to those, we are also conducting several events or workshops, the details of which uh, we can have uh, an overview on the next slide. Here we can see an overview of workshops in relation to the new BPR guidelines something that is directly linked with uh, EPRA's education plan, which uh, will be running for the entire year of 2020. So far, we have con conducted workshops in Brussels, Vienna, and Madrid, and we also had the live webinar on February 21st. In the middle, we can see upcoming workshops in various uh, European markets, such as Paris, London, Berlin, and Stockholm. Some of those had to be rescheduled due to the current COVID-19 crisis. However, we hope that uh, this is something that will be resolved soon and that we can go ahead with the dates quoted here. In any case, the workshops are a great opportunity to increase familiarity with the new guidelines as uh, they not only offer an opportunity to interact with your peers, but also because they include practical examples, Q&A sessions, open panel discussions, as well as potential uh, presentations on uh, topical real estate subjects. One other key event to be aware of is EPRA's annual, annual finance summit that is scheduled for November 18, 2020. Since last year, we have partnered up with uh, Bloomberg 
and co-host the conference at uh, their London headquarters. We have a very interesting agenda with uh, the themes ranging from valuations, property funding, sustainable finance, macroeconomic outlook, black swan events, among other themes. We hope to see you all there and have uh, an even more successful conference compared to 2019, where more than 200 attendees were present. So having said that, we encourage you to track any upcoming April related events or workshops via our website. You may find the relevant link in the snapshot that is included at the bottom left of the screen. So we're reaching to the conclusion of this webinar However, for any further assistance or queries in relation to the new BPR guidelines, the EPRA BPR framework itself, or for any other matters, then we highly encourage you to get in touch with us. We are here to support the industry and more than happy to help in every way we can. Our email address is randa at epra.com. So please feel free to get in touch and contact us. So thank you everyone for joining. We hope you found the webinar of interest and that it helped you understand the new BPR guidelines in a bit more detail. Thanks again and have a great day.